Welcome to Dr. Osborne's Zone. Look, if you struggle with an autoimmune diagnosis, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, multiple sclerosis, celiac disease, Crohn's, inflammatory bowel disease, autoimmune hepatitis, Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, whatever it is, if it's autoimmune disease, you're not gonna wanna miss the next three shows. Tonight is part one of gaming the system. Remember, the system for treating autoimmune disease has miserably failed us all, and I'm gonna teach you how to game the system back and overcome autoimmune disease with simple, actionable steps you can start starting tonight. You unlock this door with the key of compassion. Beyond it is another world, a world of science, a world of common sense, a world of sanity. You're moving into a land of both empathy and ethics, of nutritional knowledge and empowerment. You've just crossed over into Dr. Osborne's zone. So welcome to a special two-part series of the Dr. Osborne zone. This is a series we're gonna be discussing, which is an, an extension of the last three shows that we've done, the shows if so. If you haven't watched How the System Has Failed You, part one, two, and three, you might want to go back and watch those. It'll get you better prepared to take on this information. This information we're going to talk about today is what I call the autoimmune revolution. This is a step-by-step -step guide for you to take and implement both on your own, but also if you're working with a functional medicine type doctor to overcome autoimmune disease. So it doesn't matter what your autoimmune disease is, whether it's multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, autoimmune hepatitis, fill in the blank. If you have an autoimmune condition and you're fed up with standard of care, if you're fed up with regular doctors wanting to mask your symptoms with medications, this is the series that you want to make sure you watch. So get your notepad ready. We're going to dive in to the depths of what you can actually implement starting tonight. You can start implementing this information to help your body naturally overcome autoimmunity. So without further ado, let's dive right in. So again, if you're overwhelmed with your diagnosis, this discussion is all about what you're gonna be able to do naturally to overcome your autoimmune issues. Now, you'll see this little diagram here with the warrior and the hydra. Anytime you see this diagram on a slide, this is just an indicator for you that these are action items that you can take at home, things that you wanna take copious notes about so that you can implement this strategy or these multiple strategies. At the end of this, I want you all to have a blueprint that you can follow, to, again, to help restore your health. So let's talk about the origins of autoimmunity. Let's look at this slide here. Um, this is what we call the triangle of health. And you can see at the center of this slide, that's your genetic code. Now everybody has their own unique DNA. And what I want you to take away and understand is that DNA is not a curse. DNA is a gift and you don't have bad genes. And I don't care how many of you have, you know, DNA mutations, MTHFR, COMT, doesn't matter. Your genes are a gift. They're not a curse. But genes need you to have good behavior for them to appropriately respond. So if you look at this diagram, you'll see in this triangle, on the top, you'll see chemical. To the left bottom, you'll see emotional, spiritual. And to the right, you'll see physical. Now, you're going to see this trend show up multiple times as we go through this presentation. Chemical, emotional, spiritual, and physical are the three worldly inputs and choices that you have on a daily basis that are gonna impact each other, but they're also gonna impact the behavior of your genes. Again, a lot of doctors try to blame genetics on disease and nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, there are, there are minor exceptions to this rule, people with cystic fibrosis or inborn errors of metabolism, but this is, those things are really quite rare. And so most of you, are the, you're not the exception. So again, your genes are a gift but you have to approach how you treat your genes, right? If your genes are the gift and you have to take good care of them by behaving appropriately so that you can accommodate them to express in a manner that's consistent with good health as opposed to in a manner that's consistent with disease. So chemical, physical, and emotional inputs. If we go to this next slide, you'll see 
what those inputs are. So what you're looking at here at the top, autoimmune disease, okay? And it, like I said earlier, it doesn't matter what your diagnosis is. People are so heavily set on trying to identify the type of autoimmune disease. Doctors are as well. But if you, if you understand anything, understand that autoimmune disease has triggers. There's four categorical triggers of autoimmunity, and, and that's what is represented in this diagram. So this diagram should be kind of your go-to to understanding the different triggers and how you can navigate them. So if you look on the far left, you can see vitamin mineral deficiencies. And then as we move to the right, microbial imbalances, and then gluten sensitivity, as well as other food reactions, chemical reactions, chemicals like toxic metals, and then gut integrity and dysbiosis issues. And then there are physical and emotional issues. So if you look at the first six boxes from left to right, those all re are in reference to chemistry, right? So go back to that triangle that I'm referring to. Those are all representative of chemical inputs. And then when we get to the latter, to the physical issues, ha physical has its own triangle and then emotional spiritual has its own triangle. So again, I want you to tie these things in so that you can understand them. Now, moving through, where does failure occur? So, so many people come to see me in my practice. I've been practicing over 20 years. And a lot of the times they, they have these pre-existing diagnoses, multiple forms of autoimmune disease. And what ends up happening is their approach is either drugs or has been drugs, meaning their doctors have tried to mitigate their symptoms by you know, suppressing them basically, giving them an improved quality of life through artificial chemistry. And, but that doesn't, that doesn't resolve the problem. The problem still exists. Um, or people have tried a natural approach, but they've piecemealed that approach. So it's very important you understand that failure to, to achieve success occurs when people piecemeal this approach. Okay, let me give you some examples. You know, one of the chemical inputs is nutrition. If you're eating a diet that's devoid of vitamin and minerals, you're gonna be malnourished, your body's not gonna be able to heal. Even if you're sleeping enough, even if you're getting sunshine, drinking clean water, even if you're spiritually sound, emotionally sound, and physically sound, it only takes one flaw in one of these categories to dismantle or to disrupt your progress. So it's very, very important that these things that I'm showing you are what we call the non-negotiable components to restoring health. If you're not working this system in these steps, then you're piecemealing. And if you're piecemealing, you're going to be disappointed. Your outcomes are not going to be great. And, and, um, and I don't want that for you. So remember that because so many of you that have come to see me, um, you've been piecemealed literally to, to death. And I mean, not literally, but figuratively to death. And, and you're, everything you've spent money on and time and effort in doing has not worked and you're frustrated. So if you're watching this, you can't piecemeal. You can't take parts of this presentation and only apply the parts. You've got to apply it all and you want to apply it all simultaneously. Okay. So you see here, health happens when your genes are happy. Now your genes are happy when you treat them well. And so then the next question is, well, what do I need to do to treat them well? And that's, again, what this entire presentation is going to be about. So back to our diagram. Nutritional deficiencies are one of the primary drivers chemically of dysfunction in the body. What do we know about nutrition? Check out this quote from the Guyton Medical Textbook of Physiology. This is the, one of the primary textbooks that's used to teach in medical school. Okay, so each of the 100 trillion cells in the human being is a living structure that can survive indefinitely and most instances can even reproduce itself provided its surrounding fluids contain appropriate nutrients. Keyword there, appropriate nutrients, keywords. Um, vitamins and minerals are an overlooked aspect in medicine. Doctors very rarely even consider them and it's, 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 like, um, it's like pulling teeth to get a doctor to measure vitamin and mineral status. And this is unfortunate because nutrients play such a huge role in the immune system. If you look at this next image, you can see this is um, this was published years ago in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And um, so I can't take credit for this diagram, but you see the way they describe nutrition is an umbrella. 
And so the nutrients play a role in skin and mucosal and lysozyme and phagocyte and immunoglobulin and cell mediated and complement mediated and interferon mediated immunity. So these are all, think of each little sliver of that umbrella as, a, as an arm of your immune forces. And all of those are influenced tremendously by vitamins and minerals. And so when you become deficient, your immune system starts to break down. We, we learned a lot of this early on in third world countries where people don't have enough food to eat. And so they were severely malnourished. And so they're more predisposed to certain types of infectious microorganisms. They're more predisposed to their immune systems not reacting or responding appropriately. And this is one of the reasons why many of these countries where nutrition is poor, uh, where they struggle with early mortality rates. Now, in modern countries today, like the US and Great Britain and New Zealand uh, and the European Union, the, the, it's not an absence of calories that we have. We have plenty of calories. Like this is probably the first time in the history of, the, of, of recorded history where we've had ample calories um, for everyone. But here's the, the, the ticket. We're, we're actually starving of nutrients. We have plenty of calories, but we're starving of vitamins and minerals. So when you eat calories that are highly processed foods, things that are, are, again, high caloric, but low nutrition, low vitamins, low minerals, you starve yourself slowly over time. You starve your immune system and you in, inhibit your body's capacity to heal function normally. And so that's what I wanna emphasize is, that, is nutrition is super important. And this, this slide, again, referring to the immune system and reason we're focusing on immune function is because autoimmune disease starts with immune systems going bad. Now, here's an example in this next slide of a nutrient deficiency that we know can contribute to autoimmune disease. In this example, it's, it's vitamin D deficiency. And, and some argue that vitamin D deficiency is, is one of the most common deficiencies in, in modern times, right? So, in, and this is, again, especially true in industrialized countries. It's especially true in people that consume highly processed diets because vitamin D regulates inflammation. It regulates part of your immune system. So if you look here, um, this was published in, again, another study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition uh, by, by famed vitamin D researcher, my, Dr. Michael Hollick. You can see that most people think of vitamin D and they think of calcium, but you can also see that middle, if we blow up on that middle bottom center box where you can see the immunomodulatory effects, meaning vitamin D helps to modulate the immune response. And look at all those autoimmune diseases that have been linked to vitamin D deficiency, multiple sclerosis, type one diabetes, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, and periodontal disease. And there's more than that. It's this study, again, if we look at the date published in 2004, and we've learned of a lot more since 2004, but I'm showing you this for effect of understanding that a nutrient deficiency can definitely contribute to an immune system that starts to behave inappropriately. Now, essential nutrients from food, what are they? They're the fundamental building blocks of the body. Think of vitamins, minerals, carbs, fats, proteins, nucleic acids, and water. These are the nutrients. These are the things that we must get in order to heal and repair and to maintain our health. Now, most of us get plenty of carbs, fats, and proteins. Uh, it's the vitamins and the minerals and sometimes the water and, pro and the nucleic acids specifically. This is especially true of many people who follow really strict vegan-based diets where they reduce their capacity to get adequate nucleic acids or adequate, uh, rather not nucleic acids, but adequate amino acids, which are the, the building blocks to protein. So one deficiency can inhibit the healing process so the average autoimmune patient that I have seen in, in you know, 20 plus years of practice is the average person has at least four. Um, so one deficiency can cause a problem. The average person I see has at least four. Some of the more common ones, vitamin D, vitamin B12, zinc, and water, as well as omega-3 fatty acids. These are, in my experience, some of the most common. Now, for most nutrients, Serum testing has limited value. And so this is part of the conundrum or the problems. You, even if your doctor's willing to measure vitamin and mineral status, a lot of times they use serum laboratories and serum labs are very misleading. They, they, can, they can give you false normals uh, on a frequent basis. And so we don't want to rely on serum lab testing if we're trying to assess nutritional status effectively. 
We also want to understand that a lot of times gut functions have to be have to be ruled in or out. If the gut's broken, then how well is it going to absorb or digest vitamins and minerals from the food that you eat? So a lot of you have an autoimmune disease, an inflammatory disease of your GI tract, celiac disease, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, uh, regional colitis, etc. These types of gut dysfunctions can lead to malnutrition as well. So you have vitamin deficiencies that can contribute to autoimmune disease and you have inflammatory bowel issues that can contri contribute to vitamin deficiencies. So you can see how it's easy to get stuck in a vicious cycle. Now let's go to the next slide. Let's look at some of these others. So some of these are, are nutrients that are not often considered. Water, oxygen, uh, water's a nutrient and a lot of you don't drink enough of it. Um, or the type of water that you're drinking is highly contaminated with different chemicals and, and, uh, and things that you shouldn't be getting exposure to. We'll talk more about that shortly. Oxygen is a nutrient. Many of you live a very fast paced life. And as you move through your life, you, you sometimes let that sympathetic or that, that part of your nervous system, that fight or flight part of your nervous system kind of rules your day. That's what we call the fight or flight or the sympathetic nervous system. And if you're stuck in a state of sympathetic dominance, your breathing becomes shallow. So a lot of you forget to breathe. And again, we need oxygen. Oxygen is a nutrient. So harnessing your breathing and harnessing how you breathe can become a very important ally in your recovery process. So don't forget oxygen. This is why so many uh, very good alternative or integrative or functional doctors recommend treatments like hyperbaric oxygen chambers because they know that oxygen works at the microscopic mitochondrial level to help the body naturally uh, begin the healing process. And then we also have the use of medications and the risks of those medications. Uh, we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Now look at the image here. This is just an example of, again, of one nutrition deficiency and how it can impact you. In this case, iron. You see, iron leads to reduced red blood cells. Well, that means you're, you, when you have a low anemia or a low red count, you can't deliver oxygen to your tissues as effectively. So you could be breathing plenty of oxygen from the environment, but if you're anemic in any way and you don't have the ability to deliver that oxygen from your lungs to the rest of your tissues, then your body's ability or your cell's ability to generate energy through, through the process of oxidative phosphorylation, which is what we need oxygen to complete, then you end up tired and your tissues end up slowing down. Their ability to heal and repair slows down. That chronic uh, fatigue can also increase the risk for recurring infection. Remember, microbial imbalance is one of the issues that we see with autoimmune disease. And all, overall, it just slows down the body's ability to heal. So again, I've given you a couple of examples of simple nutrients and their deficiencies and the outcomes of those. But you know, there are 40 essential nutrients that you need every day. So don't forget, it's very important if you wanna recover your health that you, that you look at these and you have them objectively measured if you really wanna be successful. So many people try to take supplements and sometimes you know, it's a good idea, but sometimes the supplements you're taking aren't necessarily the ones that you need. They're the ones you think might be useful, but not necessarily the ones you absolutely need. And this is where testing can give you a huge advantage. Now, there's also drug-induced nutritional deficiency. So if you look at this next slide, just a picture of one of the textbooks that have been published on this topic. There are several texts, medical texts, that are um, basically, their, their whole premise is to help doctors understand that you don't prescribe medicine without nutritional consequences. I used to teach this topic all over the world when I, when I, it was over 15 years ago, I would, I would traverse uh, the world teaching this topic to doctors. And most of the time I was met with, uh, with open arms by a lot of doctors because when I would teach this class, there's so much research on this that is just not being taught in medical school. A lot of doctors are blown away when they start to learn this information. So don't, if you're on meds, don't forget to have this conversation with your doctor. Common drugs contribute to autoimmune disease, as I showed you in the system has failed you part one, two, and three, but common drugs also cause vitamin and mineral deficiencies that can contribute even more to autoimmune disease. So here's kind of an action step for you. Again, that you see that little warrior with the hydra in the upper right-hand corner. 
that's your cue in to take notes and that's your cue in to, to take action. So if you're on a medicine, this is where you have the conversation with your doctor. You want to talk with your doctor about how that medication might be interfering with certain vitamins and minerals. And this, this conversation should be, Doc, hey, I know you've got me on this blood pressure medication. I'm really worried, and I'm going to give you an example. Some blood pressure medications cause vitamin B1 and magnesium deficiency. So, doctor, I'm really worried about those nutrient deficiencies. Can you test me? As I'm on this medicine, can you monitor those nutrient levels to ensure that that medicine doesn't create new problems for me? And also, can you maybe prescribe those vitamins and minerals for me to take as I'm on that medication to try to help offset the problems associated with that medication. And so that's what this diagram is all about. Now, my recommendation to anybody who's using meds consistently is to ask your doctor to measure your nutrient. If they do it right, okay, and then you see here it says lymphocyte proliferation. That's the right way to measure vitamins and minerals. If you do it right, you do it twice a year. Um, and so getting your nutrition status checked, very, very smart idea to get this checked twice a year, especially if you're on medications. So some home-based action steps that you can take around nutrition, around improving your vitamin and mineral status. Number one, eliminate processed foods. Processed foods are stripped down. A lot of the vitamins and minerals are destroyed from the original food as they go through processing. So what you're left with is a shell, a nutritional shell. You're left with calories with minimal vitamins and minerals, and that will cause you to become malnourished over time. You also want to choose organic as much as possible. Pesticides, okay, don't do you any favors. Your body has to detoxify those pesticides that you're being exposed to. Well, guess what you use to do that? You use vitamins and minerals to detoxify those pesticides. Your liver uses vitamins and minerals. Your kidney uses vitamins and minerals. Your gut and your skin, all of your detoxification organs use those nutrients to properly detoxify you from those pesticides. So reduce your exposure, minimize your exposure. You also ideally want to choose nutrient dense foods that are easy to digest. This is especially true if you're having GI problems. So if your autoimmune disease is, is, is relevant to your GI tract and you're struggling with digestion, this is, you know, really pay close attention to this tip. So nutrient dense foods, what are some examples? Bone broth, Organ meats, if you don't like organ meats, you can do organ capsules. You know, some, I don't care for the way liver tastes, but I do take organ meat in capsules. We have something called um, Warrior Organ Matrix for those of you who don't like organ meats like me. And then things like berries, soups that are cooked down. And soups could be um, pressure cooked vegetables, pressure cooked meats, because when you pressure cook the foods, you soften them and make it easier mechanically for your body to digest. This, again, this is especially true of those of you who suffer with digestive problems. And then fermented vegetables as well can be very, very nutritionally helpful because they also help restore and support healthy microbiomes. Remember, a lot of your vitamins and, and nutrients are made by the good bacteria. So eating healthy fermented foods can be very beneficial in that regard. Some other action steps, and these are action steps if you're working with a doctor or a healthcare provider or a health coach, consider the following labs to assess your nutritional status. So again, take these notes. Number one, nutritional analysis using lymphocyte proliferation. I've, I've mentioned this before. Any of you who've been watching me for any length of time know how adamant I am about appropriate testing for vitamin and mineral deficiencies. There's also a test called iodine loading test, and this is a, a test that helps to isolate and measure whether or not you have adequate iodine. An iron panel, uh, a lot of doctors will not order an iron panel. They will measure what's called a CBC, a complete blood count, and they'll look at your hemoglobin and hematocrit, and if those are normal, they'll tell you you have normal iron. Well, that's an inaccurate way to assess iron. You also want your doctor to run an iron panel and ask them to run ferritin with it. Again, written down on the slide for you. CBC and chemistry panels are important. Most doctors will run those without any, um, without any coaxing. Um, a homocysteine test. Homocysteine is a byproduct that we, we all make homocysteine, but homocysteine elevations can indicate B vitamin deficiencies. B12, B6, folate, vitamin B2 deficiencies have all been linked 
to elevations in homocysteine. Hemoglobin A1C, which is an average measure of your blood sugar. If your blood sugar is too high, the likelihood that you're over-consuming carbohydrates is, 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 is very good. And, that, and not good that you're consuming an excess of carbohydrates, but the likelihood. And so you want to get that reined in. Again, my, my advice on carbs, fats, and proteins is that you're, you're striving for a quality between carbs, fats, and proteins. A third, a third, and a third. And then there's a test called a CRP, that stands for C-reactive protein, the, the DASH HS, that's HS stands for high sensitivity. This is a very sensitive marker for systemic inflammation. So if you are inflamed, this is a really good test to have your doctor measure so that as you're making these changes over time, if you're hitting the right notes, your C-reactive protein should start to drop. It should start to come down. If it's not coming down, you're missing something that's causing that inflammation. You could also add ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate is another inflammatory marker that might be helpful here as well. And then insulin. So again, these are just some standard tests that you can have done that help to assess nutritional status. Be cautious of serum lab tests for nutrients because of the inaccuracies and the misleading information and, um, and sometimes even the doctor's inability to properly interpret their results. So not recommended that you do serum lab testing and, and hang your hat out on that information. If necessary, implement diet change with premium grade supplementation to accommodate deficiencies. So if you come back and you have multiple deficiencies, it may be necessary for a time at least for you to supplement with those nutrients. And my practice is something I do on a regular basis is I enhance people's nutrition through the use of, of premium grade pharmaceutical grade supplements because I want to dig them, help them dig out of that nutritional hole faster. Remember, you need nutrients to heal. Autoimmune disease, if we really want to put it simply, it's a repair deficit. Your body's breaking itself down faster than it's capable of healing itself. And nutrients are part of what you need to heal. So sometimes we got to dig out of that hole. Now let's look at this next slide on drug-induced nutritional deficiencies. It's just if you want to pause this slide in your video and take a screenshot of it for, for later use, this is, I just want to be very clear, this is not a comprehensive slide. In other words, this doesn't include all classes of medications. This is no, not intended to be the end all be all list, but these are just some of the most common medications prescribed today. So I just want you to have access to this information at your fingertips, knowing that many of these drugs or classes of drugs have known and profound effects um, on your nutritional status and you want to be aware of that. Okay, let's move into the second category. So we just covered vitamin deficiency. Now let's go into gut integrity and dysbiosis. So the chemistry of the gut, a lot of people don't realize this. And you know, I, I was very blessed to have a fantastic professor when going through graduate school. But one of the things that, that I remember learning was the gut is a war zone. And a lot of times we don't think of it like that. We, because, and why? Socially, we think of food as, as the time we all get together and have a good time. And we, and we share food as an expression of camaraderie and love uh, and, and community. And, and that's a good way to look at it. I'm not gonna say we shouldn't look at it that way too, but let's talk about what goes on in your gut. There's a battle, there's a war that happens in your gut every time you open your mouth and put food in. Remember, even the healthiest, most organic, pristine food contains toxins. All foods contain toxins. Your gut's job is to separate toxins and poop them out and hang on to good things like vitamins and minerals and carbs and fats and proteins, the things that we need to nourish ourselves. So remember the gut is really a staging zone. It's a war zone where we quarantine the food so that we have enough time through the mechanical and the chemical actions of digestion to extrapolate the nutrients from the food while expelling the toxins that are in the food through our stool. So the function of the gut is digestion, absorption, but we also do a lot of destruction and elimination of toxins in the gut. And this is especially true if you have a healthy microbiome. Your gut bacteria helps you detoxify. That's why it's so important. Um, remember the gut is a quarantine zone. It harbors that microbiome. It also regulates water and electrolyte flow. So, you know, a lot of people become dehydrated when they're 
guts are inflamed. Uh, and we, again, we need that gut to balance our water. As I said earlier, water is a key nutrient. And then it houses 70 to 80% of the entire immune system. So you have this, this, this section in your, in your gut called the GALT, which we'll talk about in a minute, and that's your 80, almost 80% of your entire immune system. But the gut also connects and communicates with your brain. There have been books written on this topic by much smarter men than myself. Uh, one, one, in fact, called the gut-brain connection. But we know that the gut and the brain directly communicate with each other. So very, very important in your GI tract. Now let's look at what I call the five gut firewalls. These are things um, within the gut that help that quarantine barrier. And so if these things are not intact, you know, you, we all have heard this term leaky gut, as I talked about it in the, in the How the System Has Failed You series about leaky gut as being a cause of autoimmune disease. These five barriers, when breached, can contribute to leaky gut. So you can see here the first barrier on the left is your GALT. That stands for gastro-associated lymphoid tissue. And then we have tight junctions. Tight junctions are these little anchoring proteins that seal the cells of the gut lining and, and hold them together and keep them from separating out, allowing things to pass through. We have a substance called mucosal IgA. IgA is an, it's an antibody. It acts like handcuffs. It binds on the bad guys, if you will, and it helps you to excrete them out or poop them out. We have the friendly bacteria. Remember the bacteria, uh, aside from producing vitamins, aside from, uh, from helping us digest our food, the bacteria also produce mucin, which is a mucus-like substance that coats and lines and protects your gut. So these bacteria, they do that and very, very important. And then on the far right, you can see stomach acid. Stomach acid is very critical because the acid in your stomach is required not only for absorption of protein and, uh, and the absorption of, of many minerals and, and, and things like vitamin B12, but that acid serves as an immune barrier. Remember, we eat viruses and bacteria and parasites and fungus as a natural order of our daily eating. And it's that stomach acid that helps us to neutralize many of those microorganisms that do not belong. So that stomach acid is very important. This is why so many of you that take antacids, stomach acid suppression medicines like PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, that, that's why this is, can be such a bad idea. Long term, these can con contribute to severe problems and malnutrition. Now, let's look at what I also call the, the four horsemen of the GI apocalypse. So the different things that will destroy your gut lining, if, if we're summarizing them, uh, chemical exposure, gluten, microbial imbalances, and so that would be an example of a microbial imbalance, might be a yeast overgrowth in the GI tract. And then the last one being medication. Many of you were on medications that hinder or damage the GI tract. You know, antacids are just one class, but you know, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories damage the gut. Steroids damage the gut. Many of your, of your autoimmune medications actually contribute to damage to your GI tract. So remember, this is why I said earlier, medicines do not solve your autoimmune problem. They can, they can suppress your symptoms and give you an improved quality of life temporarily, but in the end of the day, medicines are, are giving you a false sense of security and not really fixing or addressing the root of the problem. Now, we know, let's look at this next slide on leaky gut. These are some of the known causes of leaky gut. So you can see going from the bottom left, gluten, then we have GMO foods, plastics, the, there are a number of plastics that we know can contribute and plastic-based chemicals that contribute to it, pesticides, over-exercising, um, you know, aggressive exercise. I get every once in a while, I'll get, I'll get a, a, a patient that um, they, they just don't want to dial it back and, and their body's trying to scream at them and trying to tell them to dial it back. So remember, aggressive exercise, we all think exercise is good, so therefore more must be better, but that's not always the truth. We know that medications can cause leaky gut. We know that bacterial imbalance and infections can cause leaky gut is actually originally dis leaky gut was originally discovered as a result of infection, um, the work of Dr. Alessio Fasano, and then food allergies and food sensitivities. Um, not just gluten. Gluten is an example of a of a food protein sens uh, sensitivity, but there's also other foods that can contribute here as well. Um, and an example of that is potato. They, they recently discussed, and this isn't true of everyone. I don't want everyone to 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 start writing in the question. Well, can I have potatoes? Potatoes. 
for some, potatoes aren't a good idea. And there, there are ways to test for that. And this is why, again, I go back to testing and not guessing. But I'm just using potatoes as an example of another food that can cause leaky gut beyond gluten. So we want to rule out what those foods are. Why do we want to know about leaky gut? If you look at the second diagram that just popped up here, you can see that if you, if you break or breach the gut lining and these little cells, these little rectangular shaped items with little hair sticking off uh, of the top, those are gastric or not gastric, those are intestinal cells. And you can see where those arrows are penetrating through. Those are examples where the barrier is breached. And so what allows, what, what happens next is the contents of the GI tract is now allowed to leak through the gut barrier into your bloodstream. And that's, so that's chemicals and toxins. And then this triggers an immune response. So immune abnormalities. This is also how people start to collect food allergies. When the gut's leaking, people start to become more and more allergic and more and more reactive to the very foods that they're eating to try to nourish themselves. That's why it's so important to figure out what those triggers are for each unique individual. And then over time, that inflammation and that barrage can, you know, as it's overstimulating the immune system, we now get the consequence of that overstimulation, which is an autoimmune assault on tissues. And any tissue in the body can be affected by autoimmune disease. Um, so, so, you know, the skin can be affected, the liver can be affected, the spleen, the stomach, you name it. Any tissue can be affected. Autoimmune disease is an equal opportunity destroyer. Okay, let's look at this next slide on drugs that affect and impact gastrointestinal function. I wanted to give you some more examples here because again, these are some of the more common ones. You see on the left, antibiotics. So this, this, if you're taking antibiotics, pain relievers, acid reflux medications, or antidepressants, this is, you see the little, again, the little hydra and the warrior there. This is, this is for you to take action on. Get with your doctor as soon as possible and have this conversation. Okay, you shouldn't be on long-term antibiotics. Um, and so that's a conversation you can have with your doctor. Pain relievers, if you've got chronic pain, you need to figure out why you have pain and, and, and quit trying to mask it. But you can see here, antibiotics destroy gut bacteria, which hinders digestion and vitamin synthesis, but also increases the risk of infection, which then also contributes to leaky gut or permeability. Um, it can lead to IBS symptoms, IBS meaning irritable bowel syndrome, not necessarily inflammatory bowel, but irritable bowel, but also nutritional disease. It also contributes to the development of autoimmune disease. So just, you can see antibiotics is a whole host of problems that they can come with, especially if you use them in a recurring fashion. If you're in and out of the doctor's office, you know, every other month taking antibiotics because you have a chronic recurring infection, you need to figure out what's happening in your immune system because those antibiotics are just going to drive the process of autoimmunity over time. You look at under the pain reliever category, you can see that pain relievers, most of your you know, steroids and non steroidal anti-inflammatories, um, they erode the mucus lining of the stomach and the upper small intestine. This has been very well researched. We know it happens and the consequence of that is blood loss. So as you're damaging the lining of the stomach and the intestine, you lose blood through that damage, that, that, that's called occult blood loss, and that can be tested for. Your doctor can measure that. But it causes iron deficiency, and as I showed you earlier on that slide, where iron deficiency leads to oxygen deficiency, oxygen deficiency leads to inability to heal effectively. You don't want that to happen. Uh, and then we have acid reflux medications, which inhibit or lower stomach acid. And so that can hinder the digestion of nutrients like protein, calcium, and other minerals, as well as vitamin B12, but it leads to weakened immunity, depression, bone loss, among other things. And then we have the antidepressants. Antidepressants can alter gut motility. Not a good idea. This contributes to constipation. Um, and when, you're, when your gut's constipated, when you eat, as your, as your food is not appropriately being digested and not moving through you at the appropriate time constraint, then it's rotting inside of you. So you actually have putrefaction byproducts of your food forming because your bowels are not moving properly. And so that gives so much more time for those toxins that are being created through digestion to leak across a leaky gut barrier. And that's gonna put more of a burden or more of a stress on your immune system. So again, if you're on these four classes of medications, 
you really want to get with your doctor and, and really strategically talk about how you can get off of them. That's the goal. Some home-based action steps here. One, for your gut, consider intermittent fasting. Many people can't tolerate long fasts, 24 plus hour fasts, but most people can tolerate 16 hour intermittent fasting. That's where you, you allow your gut to rest 16 hours out of every 24 hours. So the, the simplest way to do this is eat an early dinner and eat a late breakfast, right? And give your gut that 16 hour break to recover and heal. Remember your gut's a very fast healer but if you're constantly pumping food into it and constantly demanding it to do work when it's already broken down, this is where a lot of people get into the weeds and get into trouble. So consider intermittent fasting. Avoid all grains, dairy, legumes, and nightshades immediately. Now these are some of the tenets of the no grain, no pain diet. This is the diet I wrote in my book uh, to help resolve autoimmune disease. So if you're not familiar with the diet or the, with the book, you can also go back and use that as a resource to help you navigate diet. Eliminate processed or packaged food items immediately. As I said earlier, processed and packaged foods are not your friend. Um, they're your friend of convenience, but you know, it's, you know, processed foods like robbing Peter to pay Paul, you, you, you get the convenience today, but you get the malnutrition tomorrow, right? And, and over time, it, that adds up. So eliminating processed foods ensures that the foods that are left for you to eat are gonna be more nutrient dense and more capable of providing what your body needs to heal and repair. Perform controlled deep breathing before meals and eat in a peaceful, calm place. So many people are locked in fight or flight. They sit down on the go at a meal and they're eating fast food in their car or they're eating on the run. Um, you can't do that, your, your gut needs you to be calm and at peace and at rest. Why? Because if it's not, if, it's, if you're not there, guess where the blood flow goes? It goes to your muscles in your brain. When you're in fight or flight, your blood flow doesn't go to your gut. And when you're trying to digest your food, you need the blood going to your GI tract because that blood provides nutritional resources and oxygen so that your gut can appropriately work. So sitting down and, and being at peace and being, you know, br deep breathing before a meal, all these things can be extremely beneficial and helpful to put your mind at ease, to put your gut in a state of calm where you can activate your parasympathetic nervous system so that you can digest your food better. Um, pay attention to your GI's communication with you. When I say GI, I don't mean necessarily GI doctor. I'm talking about your gut. Your gastrointestinal tract talks to you. How does it talk to you? Well, sometimes it sends you symptoms, gas, bloating, intestinal discomfort, pain, diarrhea, upset stomach, nausea. These are all things that when you're going about your day eating, uh, you should be paying attention to those symptoms because sometimes you can figure some things out on your own without the help of a doctor. That's why these are home action steps. So, so listen to the message. If every time you eat a certain food, even though somebody else told you, even though maybe another doctor told you that was a superfood, but every time you eat it, you get sick or you feel a symptom, then listen to your body. Your body's right. So pay attention to those communications. Maintain adequate water. For most people, 60 ounces or more of water a day is adequate. If you're drinking um, reverse osmosis water, important tip, add electrolytes to the water. RO water is more acidic in nature and you want to put electrolytes back in it. Natural water has electrolytes. It's now, I like RO filters because so much garbage is in the, the city water supply, you know, depending on where you live, like in where I live, there's 42 drugs, prescription drugs that we can analyze and find in our water. Not a good thing. So if you're not on a well where the water is, is, is filtered by hundreds of feet of dirt and rock and sediment, um, you want to filter your water with RO if you're drinking out of the tap, but it's just important note to add electrolytes back to that water. Um, keep the bowels moving naturally. If you're constipated, you might want to consider the following things. Remember, constipation is one of the worst things for healing because what it does is it slows down the movement of toxins out of you. Remember, poop is a toxin. 
And as it, as it comes out, you want it to come out of you on a regular basis. And if you're not pooping every day, um, you, you're allowing those toxins to access your bloodstream a lot more frequently. So if you're constipated, you might consider some of these natural options. One, taking a strong, solid probiotic. Two, high doses or higher doses of magnesium or vitamin C. Either one of those will, will do well by a bowel. Um, so, so vitamin C, generally it takes about anywhere from two to five grams of vitamin C to help with a bowel movement. Magnesium, anywhere from three to 600 milligrams. Some people even take more, up to 1,000 milligrams to help with regular bowel function. Digestive enzymes. You know, some of you, your, your pancreas is inflamed or your pancreas is being damaged or your gut is damaged. And so your capacity to produce digestive enzymes might be hindered. So taking an external or taking a supplemental digestive enzyme might be very supportive. Remember, you need these enzymes to break your food down and have regular bowel movements. Apple cider vinegar, it's a natural acid and taking a little bit before you eat a meal, especially a meal with animal protein, could help you digest that a little bit better if you were struggling with protein digestion. Also consider acid or bile supplements. You could use something like a betaine hydrochloride to support acid digestion in your gut. And if you don't have a gallbladder, if you have a history of liver disease, consider um, supplements that help, uh, help support that function. Uh, we have something called Lipogest that we use in people that don't have gallbladders, and we have something called Ultra Acid that we use for people who need more acid support. Now, pay very close attention as well to foods that are high in FODMAPs. Uh, if you haven't heard of FODMAPs, you can do a quick Google search and pull up you know, numerous information on which foods are FODMAPs. Pay, high, pay close attention to foods that are high in oxalates and histamines as well. And the reason I say it is not everybody is reacting to FODMAPs, oxalates, and histamines, but many people who have already done a really good job of going grain-free and dairy-free and sugar-free, many of them still struggle with certain FODMAPs or histamine or oxalate-based foods. So keep those in mind. They, they may be, there may be some additional strategy if you're paying attention to that you find is helpful in terms of your overall diet change. Now also be cautious of supplements containing GMO or other taboo ingredients. You know, every, every week somebody comes in to my practice, you know, with a, with a bag of supplements, uh, multiple people actually, and, and um, a lot of times the supplements that they're taking are garbage. They're, they're full of fillers that are no good for them or they're full of ingredients that they're allergic to or they're full of um, GMO. Uh, derived ingredients and you want to be really careful there because the whole premise of using a supplement is that it's to supplement your body to help you on your journey but if your supplement is actually detrimental in some way then the whole premise of taking it becomes neutralized so here's some additional action steps if you're working with a functional doctor or a, or a healthcare provider or coach is have functional GI testing performed. So again, we're talking about the gut. And so a good GI test um, could rule out imbalances and dysbiosis, could rule out um, a number of different things. Examples, you know, yeast overgrowth, bacterial abnormalities, you know, parasitic or viral problems, et cetera. So a good practitioner can help you navigate that through proper testing. Um, SIBO, which is another type of, of condition that some people struggle with, that stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, that can be tested for as well. A pra good practitioner can help you with that test. Consider biofilms, especially if, if, um, if you've already worked with practitioners to try to get rid of uh, a bacterial imbalance, consider biofilms. Um, a lot of doctors don't consider them, um, but you can have a conversation about biofilm with your doctor. Biofilms are basically protective domes that bacteria and fungus can produce that prevent your immune system from being effectively eradicative of those, of those problems. So basically it's, it's like the bacteria, the yeast produces a shield around itself to protect them from you and your immune system. So biofilms can be degraded by specialized types of agents um, like EDTA, they can be degraded by specialized types of proteolytic enzymes. So again, these are conversations you can have with your doctor if you do suspect biofilm. If you've gone through some type of cleansing, gut cleansing protocol for yeast or some other kind of bacteria and, and it has not been effective, 
consider biofilm as a potential reason why. You want to, again, assess the microbiome. What kind of good bacteria do you have? In what species do you have? Do you have adequate uh, representation of, of the right types of species? A good test can give you some of that feedback and information and even can help you target which kinds of probiotics might be better for you as a unique person. You want to assess the production of acid, of digestive enzymes, of a compound called short-chain fatty acids, the primary one being butyrate, and a substance called IgA. So again, a good practitioner can measure all of these things because knowing whether these things are low or high can sometimes make the difference in your improvements. You want to assess for inflammation in your gut. There are several different chemical markers good doctors will measure. A lot of GI doctors measure things like calprotectin, but there are other markers as well, like lactoferrin is, is an example of another marker. So these things can all be measured with good objective testing. And then depending on the extent of damage, you may need a supplemental source of immunoglobulins. This is, a, again, a supplement you can talk to your doctor about, but can be very, very helpful. As a matter of fact, I think this was, was like 12 years ago, um, we were using immunoglobulins in practice and then one day we just, we, you know, we stopped being able to get access to them for our patients. And one of the reasons why is there was a pharmaceutical company that bought up the producer of these immunoglobulins and they turned it into a prescription drug. And so what used to be a $50 product became a $500 medication. Um, now to, and, and, so, and so now today we, we, we actually have access to immunoglobulins again. You don't necessarily need a prescription to get them. But that's how powerful they are, is that the, the drug companies wanted to capture and, and capitalize on the market, but it just didn't happen. Uh, it didn't happen. Thank, thank goodness it didn't happen. So you do have access to, to what are called serum-derived immunoglobulins, which can be a very effective and very powerful tool to support you on your journey. And then you want to assess nutrients. Um, the gut will never heal if you're deficient, for example, in vitamin A, um, in L-glutamine in vitamin C and zinc and B12 and folate. The gut can't heal without those nutrients. Those are very critical gut healing nutrients. So assessing those can also make or break the difference. Look, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. And before you sign out, I wanna leave you with this amazing story of an autoimmune recovery. Check this out. One day I woke up, went to work, and I just couldn't have a bowel movement. I had been um, living great, you know, no, no health issues, and um, just was in, in agony and pain and couldn't figure out why. So I went on a search, uh, went to several doctors, and I visited every gastroenterologist, every specialist. Um, I had every colonoscopy, endoscopy, um, every test you can think of done and just really got depressed uh, to the point where my last doctor visit, uh, I was told that I just have to live with it. One of the recent jobs that led me to Dr. Osborne was actually the greatest thing that could have happened because it was an hour away from my home and it was the longest I had to travel before to a job. I'd come across this podcast called I Love Marketing. And it seems ironic that I would be listening to a marketing podcast and that's how I would discover Dr. Osborne. And he's sharing all these insights based on his newly written book, No Grain, No Pain. And as soon as he started talking, I knew this was something completely different than I had ever heard before. Six months later, we were able to get that visit uh, to Sugarland, Texas, and he spent such quality time from the beginning. Uh, I never met a doctor like Dr. Osborne. He asked questions I had never been asked. He spent almost two hours uh, with me going through my entire life history. And so I signed up for all the tests uh, that he suggested. From the beginning, I found out exactly uh, what was causing the pain. I found out that I was uh, sensitive to gluten, uh, and that it was genetic. I started the protocols with Dr. Osborne, 
um, such as changing my specific diet uh, needs based on my unique allergies outside of my gluten sensitivity. Uh, I found out that I was sensitive to a host of other things as well, um, including coffee, which was the biggest thing for, I think for me to give up um, because that's the only thing that kept me going for all those hours at work with no food. Then I started uh, taking supplements that he prescribed because I had a host of uh, vitamin deficiencies that over time, obviously from not eating and uh, not getting the right nutrient values that I was really sickly in, in that respect as well. And uh, immediately in those first couple months, I could see such a change in my mood, a change in uh, my energy level and gradually every month I was getting more hope because I was putting on a little bit more weight. I was getting a little bit more energy. I was having less brain fog, less nausea. Um, you know, I was learning how to change my lifestyle. The last two years have been phenomenal. Um, you know, just to think that there wasn't any hope in my life to now living every day where I can feel great. I can get up every morning, you know, before sunrise now. I can exercise. I can walk and run every day. Everything in my life has completely changed. So, um, you know, when I say that it's been, you know, a 180, you know, it really has. I've been very fortunate because of my passion for all the changes in my life. Uh, to help uh, 10 other people so far um, dramatically change their life by following the same protocols. Uh, those people had very similar symptoms, some worse, some less than me. Um, they've been able to find relief uh, through Dr. Osborne and No Grain, No Pain because of that, and I'm very grateful for that. Thanks for tuning in to the Dr. Osborne Zone. Don't forget to share, like, and subscribe for more content like this. And make sure you come back next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time and Thursday at noon 30 for more episodes.